You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Hi, I'm Matt Albers, host of the Pirate History Podcast. The men and women of the golden age of piracy are some of the most infamous and often misunderstood characters in all of human history. You know their names. Anne Bonny, Henry Avery, Mary Reed, Captain Kidd, Blackbeard. But do you know their stories, their real stories? Every week over on the Pirate History Podcast, we examine what made these pirates sail the high seas in search of plunder and adventure and revenge. If you'd like to hear the stories of the real men and women who went on the account and sailed under the black flag, join us on the Pirate History Podcast. That is the voice of a one-time quasi-presidential candidate, Will Rogers. Robert Sherwood, editor of the humor magazine Life, okay, not the same as Life magazine that you and I know and love with all the nice photos, suggested to comedian Will Rogers that he run for president. Rogers reacted in a probably different way than a contender of today might, he said. The offer to run him struck him like a bolt out of the blue, leaving him dazed. But then he realized that, being dazed, he would make a splendid candidate. And so Will Rogers became the candidate of the anti-bunk party and began writing a series of articles for Life, the humor magazine, promoting his candidacy. It went from Memorial Day 1928 to Election Day, and this is the election in which Al Smith and Herbert Hoover were running for the presidency. But Will Rogers offered some interesting campaign choices. For instance, he said, Whatever the other fella don't do, we will. And he said, There'll be more wine for the rich, more beer for the poor, and moonshine liquor for the prohibitionist. He also promised that, if elected, he would resign. And he would make no campaign promises other than that. He received a good number of high-profile endorsements for his day, including Amelia Earhart, Babe Ruth, and Henry Ford. Our support, he said, will have to come from those who want nothing and have the assurance of getting it. I don't have a vote total for Will Rogers in the 1928 election It is said that he gained a substantial write-in vote, he claimed, to have won the District of Columbia. But probably the better known, in our time at least, is the 1968 candidate Pat Paulson. He was a regular on the Smothers Brother Comedy Hour, and he first announced that he was running for president in 1968 as the candidate for the straight-talking American government party. He repeatedly described himself as the common, ordinary, simple savior of America's destiny. We cannot stand Pat, he said. We can be decisive, probably. United we sit. If elected, I will win. Well before Stephen Colbert, he was responding to all criticism with the phrase, picky, picky, picky. Paulson campaigned through the entire United States and told every community that he spoke in that that community was his favorite, filled with real people, not like those phonies in California. But of course, when he arrived in California, Pat Paulson said, This is my real home, not like those phonies in other places. Now, I don't have a good figure for the amount of write-in votes that Pat Paulson got in 1968, but in 1972, he really did run on the ballot as a Republican in the New Hampshire primary and received 1,211 votes against President Nixon. 
He got more votes when he ran again 20 years later in 1992. And he finished with nearly 11,000 votes nationwide in the Republican primary of that year. Paulson also ran as a Democrat in 96 and received 1,000 votes against President Clinton in New Hampshire. He was unable to run further because he died in 1997. But in terms of candidates in the tumultuous year of 1968, the most infamous had to be Pegasus, the immortal. August 23rd, 1968, outside the Democratic National Convention in Chicago, the Yippies Youth International Party presented their candidate for the U.S. presidency, Pegasus the Immortal, a 160-pound pig. Here's what the Yippies argued. They nominate a president and he eats people. We nominate a president and the people eat him. His platform? was to be a pile of garbage, just like the platform of all the other parties. Pork power. Unfortunately, Pegasus had one of the most infamous careers of any presidential candidate. Just after his official introduction to the presidency, police arrived and loaded him into a police wagon citing a law that banned bringing in livestock into the city of Chicago. The Yippies were also arrested and charged with disorderly conduct. We know this much. Pegasus was released, taken to an anti-cruelty society, given a bath, fed, placed in a pen. What happened to him later was unknown, but he had no further run for political office. I think of all of this. As I think about the candidacy, or quasi-candidacy, whatever this really is, of Donald Trump and the amount of media attention that he's attracting versus the number of candidates in the race. And I think the one might be a function of the other, quite frankly. I think the large number of candidates in the race, a lot of people would think, right, more attention on the race. But in effect, I think it's made each of the candidates look very small. And so the one candidate that has some celebrity status, some status as a business person, and frankly, just a person that's been in public life for a long time, rises to the top, at least the media's attention. So I got this question. Why does Donald Trump speak so openly without any concerns for potential consequences? And it's interesting. I think that people say so often that they want a politician to say what's on their mind, not to take a poll before speaking. Also, that they want a person who doesn't back down no matter what, who will ignore the opinions of other politicians, certainly, of interest groups, certainly, of the media, certainly. But it seems like when one of these individuals comes along, watch out. People end up hating it. So I do think that nothing can be better for the business of professional consultants, midnight poll takers, and for that matter, career politicians who have some polish and can speak to a democracy of 300 million people without offending people in big swaths. It turns out there's a little bit of a skill to it. And I think after somebody like A. Trump has a good run, the value of those things goes up. But I think in this case, in 2015, the early going, there's so many people running, particularly for the Republican nomination, although the Democratic field is expanding too. Anyone who can keep that small percentage First of all, he's going to maintain his place uh, in the Fox News debate. There's only going to be a limited amount of slots for that. And he's going to push some others out. So being the most outrageous candidate at this time has some advantages. I think he's made some really outrageous statements. I can't even fathom how a Republican candidate now would want to completely write off the Hispanic vote with some of the comments that he's made. But I know at least in the short game why he's doing it. Even when he made comments about McCain that have been roundly criticized by other Republicans, it hasn't really damaged him that much in the polls. Where I do think Trump will have some issues running into this is in the state-by-state primary races. So his national 
percentages, probably by being this outrageous figure really high. But in Iowa, I think he'll have issues. He might be a strong second. The actual primaries are where the rubber hits the road, I think. After Citizen United, even after there's an ability to raise more money, I still think that once you start having those state races, you'll see things filter out a bit. But his strategy right now is perfect for what this is, this early immediate campaign. I'm going to venture a guess, too, that if we consider Jeb Bush to have been the quasi-front runner for the GOP nomination, somebody like a Trump who's going to steal thunder, steal media attention, is actually going to damage that. Why? Well, it limits the front runner's ability to put an end to the game. Because they're not necessarily the front runner. They're not getting all the attention. They're not stealing the oxygen from everyone else because there's some other factor in the race doing that. So I almost think it acts as a shield for about four or five other candidates. Oddly enough, I think someone like a Trump is Scott Walker's best friend. Are you going to allow them to build up a little? And for about four or five, they have that kind of shield that before Jeb Bush can consolidate his position as a front runner, the oxygen is being taken up by someone else. We talked about how in 1988, Dukakis was able to one by one kind of eliminate the other seven dwarfs in his competition and become the front runner. He didn't have anything like a Trump in the race, kind of a black hole for the media taking the attention before he could take lift and become front runner. So this is, this is interesting for that reason. We will see how long it's last. I figure this. He has reckoned that a small percentage is valuing, probably overvaluing his say it like it is in a world they perceive as being run by controlling elites of left and right. With such small percentages, I suspect the supporters that he has tend to be rabid in their support and not easily turned off. I heard a supporter say this. He may not always be in the right, but he's never in doubt. You launch an independent campaign in 2016 to start being outrageous like this. You're stealing a lot of thunder from that main campaign. Maybe you have a shot. The one thing goes all the way back to the Constitutional Convention is that there's a separate presidential election. It's not connected like it is in other countries, UK, Canada, other places, to the parliamentary or congressional election. It's its own election. And frankly, anyone can win. If they have enough support in enough states, they can triangulate the other two and win in any given four years. It hasn't happened significantly. Some people say Abraham Lincoln was the first third party presidential candidate. I don't agree. I think that was the Republicans were a major party by 1860, in my opinion. Already ran in 1856. Major party. But some people say that. Fine. 1912, which we're going to talk about a little bit later. Didn't win. But there's always been that shot. It just hasn't happened yet. You know, we don't really have, as we said, a person who ran with a kind of independent style winning the presidency. They were always connected to one party or the other. And as we've talked about so many times here, those parties have long roots in history. But you have had a couple situations where you've had independent governors. So I'm thinking of Lowell Weicker in Connecticut. Now, he was a former Republican, but always a moderate Republican, ran for governor as an independent. One of the things he said is, look, the best thing was when I was governor and I proposed a bill, a new tax, and the Republicans didn't have to take the blame for proposing it, and the Democrats didn't have to take the blame for proposing it. They could vote for it for different reasons, but they didn't have to be the ones to blame for it. They could both blame me, and that was very helpful. So there's an interesting dynamic that can occur with somebody who's a little more independent-minded, as I do think running for the Republican nomination or not, someone like Trump would be. But Lil Weicker was a very calm guy. So you have another example. And in 1998, Jesse Ventura, who had been a professional wrestler, won the governorship of Minnesota. And it's not something that's talked about a lot, and there haven't been a lot of those victories. There was Angus King in Maine, but haven't been a lot of independent victories since then. You know, there were mixed opinions on how he did. Some people actually came off and saying that Jesse Ventura did really well. Just on the numbers, came into office with a $4 billion surplus in Minnesota, left with a $4.5 billion 
deficit. But then again, the economy had declined between 98 and 2002. Here's what the Republican House Speaker Steve Sviggum said at the time in Minnesota. There are times he just charmed you tremendously, you know, just very, very charming. And in the next minute, you'll be shaking your head and saying, you know, I don't want anything to do with this individual. He had a mix of proposals. In one hand, he had a massive property tax credit. On the other hand, he tried to unsuccessfully to expand the sales tax to include services, something a lot of policy groups think is necessary. I often don't know, particularly when it's something that's not in my zone of knowledge or in a local area to me. So I went on Reddit to see what some of the Minnesotans were saying about how Ventura was at the time or in, in a recent discussion, what they remembered. Here's a couple comments. I lived in Minneapolis for a year. Many people remembered him fondly, widely credited for the good light rail connecting downtown Minneapolis to the airport and Mall of America. Governor Ventura, said another Reddit user, famously said he would not call a special session to work out the kinks in bills that had not passed in time. He owed nothing to anyone, and as a result, the legislature had to avoid the brinksmanship that characterizes our usual legislative sessions and had to confer with each other so that they could present veto-resistant bills to Governor Ventura before the end of the regular legislative session. We had a couple of very productive years because of that. Here's another one. He wasn't especially bad, but he wasn't especially good. You know, and many of his big agenda items were like, this thing was unpleasant for me as Jesse Ventura, so it must change. Here's another one. He vetoed a lot of bills, far greater than the typical, had those vetoes overturned. He did the blue transit line, pushed through some property tax reforms. Otherwise, most of what he did wasn't impactful for the long term, and he didn't run for re-elections. He was a pretty average governor. Most outsiders don't realize his being elected was somewhere between a joke and a statement about how awful his opponents were. So I think there's a lot of mixed uh, feelings, but I will tell you that there's this slight kernel in my mind that it's tempting to think about somebody who's independent of party coalitions and politics getting an executive office for a little bit. It's also a bit scary, too, and there's some stories with Governor Ventura at the time about him yelling at citizens, yelling at teachers and things like that at meetings and making some silly statements in addition to doing some things that seem sensible. Personally speaking, based on the comments I've heard from Trump so far, based on the way that he reacts to things, I wouldn't want him in such an office, but it's tempting to think about an individual who really was independent who would take that office and how different the country might be. Hi, I'm Matt Albers, host of the Pirate History Podcast. The men and women of the golden age of piracy are some of the most infamous and often misunderstood characters in all of human history. You know their names. Captain Morgan, Anne Bonny, Henry Avery, Mary Reed, Captain Kidd, Blackbeard. But do you know their stories, their real stories? Every week over on the Pirate History Podcast, we explore the real lives of these pirates. We examine what made these pirates sail the high seas in search of plunder and adventure and revenge. The real stories are a lot more complex and a lot more interesting than the stories most of us have been told. If you'd like to hear the stories of the real men and women who went on the account and sailed under the black flag, Join us on the Pirate History Podcast. Well, given that there's a proposal for a deal with Iran, of course, Neville Chamberlain, my good old friend from last year, is back in the news. Uh, I like MJ Shepard's comment on Facebook, and I'm going to read that about an article in the National Review that says how the Iran deal is shockingly similar to Britain and France appeasing the Nazis before World War II. Just change the names, and you realize we are living through a repetition of Munich. I don't think that's the case, but let me read uh, M.J. Shepard's comments here. A historical nonsense from someone who is supposed to be bright enough to know better. Prager, the author of the article, would do well to listen to Bruce Carlson's astonishing series on Chamberlain on his My History Can Beat Up Your Politics podcast. Thanks, MJ. Really appreciate it. A couple of comments here. 
I always have a bit of a hard time because comments made about Munich on the internet are generally very fast, quick, right? And my analysis of what I felt this real situation was was never Chamberlain and, and Munich was a slow analysis that took three hours, but more than that, it took months, really, of research just to get, I think, all of the facts behind that case, behind what really happened. I do think that the whole analogy is used inappropriately in most cases. But I always have a bit of a hard time. My analysis of three hours of Neville Chamberlain doesn't sum up well. And I'm not going to try to summarize it now. I just will say briefly, I'd start with, you know, you have a lot of events before Munich happened in 1938. France tries to launch a war, does launch an attack on Germany early in 1923 that has disastrous results. And so there already was an aggressive action that occurred. You know, the few years that Chamberlain bought, I believe, were needed. There wasn't significant army going on in Britain until 1935, just three years before. They didn't have the radar. They didn't have the Spitfires. They didn't have anything that was going to win that battle for them in 1940. There's no real comparison to this situation because in Chamberlain's policy choices, you know, this is so often presented as the choice of the United States and Chamberlain together. No, it was not. It was Chamberlain's alone. So he had to think about British policy as opposed to American policy because guess what? In the time of 1938, the USA wasn't helping. So it's a very different situation. You also had the presence of Joe Stalin in Russia, which Chamberlain was afraid of and still needed Germany kind of as a bulwark. So very different factors as what you have going here. But yet the comparison is the same thing. Anytime you treat with anyone, apparently it's it's Munich. We moderns want to send a historical Chamberlain into a war with Germany without radar and spitfires and... You know, there's no time travel machine that would allow us to join him on that policy choice we wish him to make for him and his country. People forget that this deal, and I fully welcome criticism of the deal or or examining the deal, but do remember that this is an E3 slash EU plus three deal. That means that this isn't just President Obama of the United States cutting a deal with Iran. This is E3, which is the three big countries of Europe. So that means... uh, Merkel, Hollande, and Cameron are driving this deal, plus the rest of the European Union, plus the three. And the three are America, Russia, and China. This is we are the world making a deal with Iran. One of the things that Chamberlain says back in the time of Munich uh, to one of the letters to the sisters is like, look, I made this deal, and now if it's broken, everyone's going to see who I'm dealing with, and America can't help but get involved. When he was cutting a deal for peace, Franklin Roosevelt saying, good man, Chamberlain, good man. He wasn't getting help on the war front or any kind of, in, in taking any kind of stand at that point. So uh, there's definitely some misunderstandings that go on. And uh, it might get different if someone compared, say, some of these things to the Rhineland when Germany was very, very weak. And maybe a stand there could have averted a lot. But when you start talking about 1938, then you have to give me a scenario where within one month, uh, let's say Iran could send uh, planes over and start bombing the United States. And those are the type of policy considerations that Chamberlain needed to deal with. And they were not that far at all from the legacy of a devastating war with Germany that had killed millions. We don't need to go through the whole analysis, but I think you you get here that I don't, I dislike that Munich analogy for all of those reasons. Okay, uh, since I talked about Trump and Jesse Ventura, I feel like I need to talk about something else as well, just to make this a meaty podcast. So a real quick question I got on Cora, which I think is interesting. Do you believe that in 1912, Woodrow Wilson was more of a progressive than was Theodore Roosevelt? Why? So in the 1912 election, I'd say no. Wilson was not more progressive than Theodore Roosevelt. The progressive party went further than the Democrats or Wilson. 
Wilson inherited some of the conservative mantle. He had Southern support, even though he was largely considered a progressive in the press and had certain progressive tendencies. Even Taft, to a limited extent, had some progressive appeals in the campaign. Really, 1912 was the election of three progressives. The country had just changed, and there were certain things they just wanted to enact. But compare Wilson and Roosevelt's platform, so the Bull Moose progressive platform, to the Democratic platform in 1912 on a few issues. And let's see. On workers' compensation, the progressive Bull Moose platform. Standards of compensation for death by industrial accident and injury and trade diseases, which will transfer the burden of lost earnings from the families of working people to the industry and thus to the community. Here's the Democratic Party platform, that of Wilson. We pledge the Democratic Party, so far as federal jurisdiction extends, keywords, to an employee's compensation law providing adequate, keywords, indemnity for injury to body or loss of life. The progressive bull moose platform clearly advocates for the prohibition of child labor. Democratic Party platform, no mention of child labor. Progressive Bull Moose Platform, 1912. The Progressive Party, believing that no people can justly claim to be a true democracy which denies political rights on account of sex, pledges itself to the task of securing equal suffrage to men and women alike. On the Democratic Party Platform of 1912, a search for the word women or sex reveals zero hits. This pattern's fairly consistent. The Progressives call for a six-day work week, it's not mentioned by Democrats. Roosevelt wanted a stronger national regulation of industries. Wilson had a more conservative, use the law in the books type argument. Roosevelt wanted reform of the courts. Wilson campaigned against Roosevelt's radical proposals. Roosevelt dreams of workers' comp. Wilson focuses on this conservative plank. We denounced the prolific waste of money wrung from the people by oppressive taxation through the lavish appropriations of recent Republican Congresses, which have kept taxes high and reduced the purchasing power of the people's toil. Sounds like a GOP speech today, doesn't it? That's Wilson, 1912. However, this must be said. Theodore Roosevelt, the bull moose, unchained candidate of 1912, was a little bit different than Theodore Roosevelt, the president, the Republican president from 1901 to 1909. During his presidency, he did not advocate for the same issues that he did as a candidate of the Progressive Party in 1912. But in 1912, he was divorced from the entire conservative GOP establishment after he walked out of the convention in Chicago and founded his own Bull Moose Progressive Party. President, he had to deal with the conservative GOP Speaker of the House, Uncle Joe Cannon, generally did not get around him. By 1912, thanks to a revolt by progressive Republicans and Democrats, Joe Cannon who had blocked so much of what Theodore Roosevelt would have done in office, was out of power. That being said, Roosevelt's got some really progressive, kind of far out there proposals. One is, when an act passed under the police power of the state is held unconstitutional under the state constitution, he's particularly talking about child labor, minimum wage, some things that progressive state legislatures wanted. When it's held unconstitutional by the courts, the people after an ample interval for deliberation, shall have an opportunity to vote on the question whether they desire the act to become law, notwithstanding such decision. Now, this means that if the court rules something unconstitutional, people would get a chance to vote to determine if they think it's unconstitutional. There'd be all kind of interesting possibilities, by the way, for both left and right if such a provision were passed. Now, keep in mind, it's only if something that is passed by a Congress or by a state is ruled unconstitutional by the courts that the people get to vote, not the other way around. They hold something constitutional, it is what it is. Anyway, that's a proposal that Theodore Roosevelt had that was really far out there and never became law. You know, Wilson got a couple of things that he he liked primaries were popularized during his presidency. He never got the initiative referendum that he wanted, but eventually the eight-hour workday that was in the Democratic Party platform was 
instituted for national public works and extended later to railroad workers under his presidency. The Democrats voiced in their platform about making labor unions legal, blocking the use of antitrust against unions. They would pass laws to that effect. But generally, I'm reminded of a moment in the campaign trail in 1912 where William Howard Taft, the current president, who had just had this bitter dispute with Roosevelt, and Woodrow Wilson meet each other. And they get along warmly. I mean, to some degree, I think Taft wanted Woodrow Wilson to win and really for Theodore Roosevelt to lose more than Taft wanted the presidency for himself even. So there was more of a connection with the conservative Taft and kind of the quasi-conservative Wilson, although there were some progressive elements working his party too. And I think that it's correct to say that the, the Bull Moose platform was more progressive. And in certain ways, certainly if you look at progress on race relations, Woodrow Wilson set the clock back. On union, on uh, organizing in the United States, child labor, novel devices in international relations, I think Woodrow Wilson makes a contribution there. And both Taft and Theodore Roosevelt were for tariffs at a level that I think would be too high, uh, certainly for most Americans today, protective tariffs to protect American industries. So Wilson was a free trader to the extent that you consider that to be an issue you consider progressive. Wilson was far ahead on that issue and got more done. So there you have it. I want to thank you for listening. The website is www.myhistorycanbeatupyourpolitics.com. If you like the program, go to the website, make a donation. I am very grateful for those who have donated already. And if you like the program, please tell someone about it. Thanks for listening.